Okay, there we go. All right, we're going to be recording, well, we're recording for those who can't come, but uh, we're going to be in the book of Mark chapter six tonight as we continue our study. Uh, this past week, we talked about Jesus healing the demon-possessed man, the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, and we also discussed the, um, the 12-year-old girl that had passed away, Jairus's daughter, that is, and uh, that Jesus raised her from the dead. And uh, we, we, see, we saw some of those similarities on Wednesday night, and then we talked about it a little bit in our sermon on Sunday as well. And now we move into more miracles, but we also see the continued reactions people have to Jesus as Jesus begins to more clearly demonstrate and proclaim who he is. But we also see kind of some side stories taking place in this part of Mark. And so we take a break from the amazing miracles, if you will, to read chapter six, the first uh, six verses where Jesus goes to his hometown. In verse one of chapter six, if you'll open up your Bible, it says, he went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Now, one of the things we notice throughout the Gospels about Jesus is Jesus would regularly go to worship on the Sabbath. Uh, it says in Luke that he went to the Sabbath to worship, as was his custom. And so we see that Jesus would often go to worship as the custom of the day was to do it on the Sabbath. Isn't that great? Even Jesus went to church. And um, I think, to me, the strongest argument for going to church is not misusing the Hebrews passage where it says, don't forsake the assembly of the saints, because we forget the before and after text that give the context of that. To me, the strongest argument for going regularly to church is the fact that if we are Christ-like, if we're Christian, we do the things Christ did. One of those things Christ did is he regularly went and worshiped with others. And so um, I, I think Luke 4, Mark 6, these passages are strong encouragement that we ought to follow his example and go into uh, worship on a weekly basis. But that's not what our study tonight is about. So we're going to continue moving forward. And so it says he, on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And once again, we hear, we see him teaching. And as he taught, many who heard him were astonished. So we've talked about in Mark that the word amazed and astonished, depending upon your translation, is a common theme, such as discipleship is a common theme with the Gospel of Mark as well, but we see this over and over coming into play, and now as he's teaching, they're amazed at what he's teaching. We see Jesus as a boy at 12 years old, if you remember um, the timeline when you splice all the Gospels together at 12, Jesus is in the temple, and they're amazed not at his teaching, but at his understanding at 12 years old. Now, in his ministry, they're amazed at his teaching. They're, they're astonished, uh, saying, how could this person be able to teach in this way? Because look what it says. They're astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are and are not his sisters here with us? And so they were amazed. They were saying, what on earth? How on earth is this man able to teach like this? How does he have this knowledge? How does he have such great wisdom? Uh, you guys ever met someone who you just look at them and you never thought they would be one of the wisest people you would ever meet? But it goes to that old saying, don't judge a book by its cover, right? And Jesus out of Nazareth, a little bitty place, speaks in a way that brings amazement to those who are listening. But look what it says, that as they were questioning this, it says, and they took offense at him. They were offended. They were offended at the fact that this man from this little nowhere 
town and, and this nowhere province, if you will, had such great power, had such great teaching, had such great authority, and, and they were offended. They're, look, they're saying, well, look, we watched this guy grow up. These are his brothers and his sisters. We, we watched them. There is no way this is this kid that we watched grow up. And they were offended. And then Jesus said to them in verse 4, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. So why do you think they were offended? Why do you think he was rejected in his hometown? Of all places, why is it when he goes home that they become offended and rejected? Any ideas? I don't want to be the only one talking. They were jealous. They were jealous. That's really good. I think that's part of it. Absolutely. What other reasons? I mean, think about it. This still happens today. They saw him grow up as a little boy. Yeah, they saw him grow up, and that brings both the good and the not so good, doesn't it? Because when you see someone grow up, you kind of think, how on earth could this person be this? Because we, you know, it's that mentality. We know what he was like growing up, right? And sometimes we don't realize people have a change in life when they mature and they get older. I think there's several things that are going on, but we see Jesus throughout this chapter, even though he gets rejected, throughout this chapter, he's going to continue teaching and discipling his, um, his 12, especially, but anyone who follows him. Um, the reaction is one of three questions when he goes home. Where did Jesus get the teaching and his authority was the first one. Who gave him this wisdom? And that's key here. Um, where did this man get these things in the ESV in verse 2? And what is the wisdom given to him? And how are such mighty works done by his hands? Mark specifically puts the questions in here because it gives us clues as to they are still not grasping, even in his hometown, they're still not grasping who Jesus actually is is now i believe some of this is because many of these are burying their heads in the sand to it right they just don't want to hear it because jesus doesn't look he doesn't speak he doesn't act the way that they thought the messiah would look speak and act and they just can't wrap their heads around it but they they ask these three questions the third being where did basically he get the ability to do these types of miracles um, what's interesting, let me find it here. I didn't write down the verse this was in. <laughs> okay, well, apparently I pulled that from one of the other Gospels, so we're just going to move forward from the comment I was going to make. Uh, oh, no, there it is. Definitely, I, I pulled it from this. It's in verse 3. Um, I thought it was this Gospel. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? So that's just kind of an interesting tidbit I found whenever I was researching. Uh, one of the commentators uh, brought this out uh, whenever I was uh, researching uh, about like how they used family names back then. Normally, it was son of Joseph or um, son of whomever, like Ben Hadad would be son of Hadad is what that comes out to be. Um, and they would put only the son of, and then include the mother's name only whenever the father was not in the picture or the father was unknown to the individual. And so this was common practice among the Jews to use the father's name whenever he was alive or even when he was dead. And a man was called the son of his mother only when his father was unknown or 
when they were attempting to insult somebody. So Josephus does this in his histories whenever he's trying to insult people uh, that he clearly doesn't like. And he, he's a historian, but he's a very biased historian. <laughs> And um, whenever Josephus doesn't like someone, he will sometimes do this because it was a Jewish way back then of insulting someone. Um, and, and so we see that brought up. This whole thing is riddled with questions, with controversy, with insults, if you will, against Jesus. And it's his hometown, his home people they are going to reject. And look what it says in verse 5. In verse 5, he could do no mighty work there. In other words, no miracles like he was doing. Except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. A few. We just saw masses of people being healed just before this. We saw a girl being raised from the dead. We saw masses of people crowding around Jesus wanting healing. We saw a woman touch his garment and be healed. We saw all these, we saw a demon possessed man be freed from it, demons. And previous to chapter five, we saw masses getting healed. And then he goes to his hometown and it says he did a few healings. A few. Now, if I was writing a story and I was trying to make someone look amazing, I personally wouldn't put that in, but Mark does this for a reason. Why do you think Mark put this detail in chapter six? Why do you think he pointed out the fact that he couldn't do very many healings? Why is that important to us? It's, uh, it's, I think part of it is Jesus does not force himself on others. If, if they didn't want him there, then, then he moved on. The heart has yes. to be right. And we, we specifically see that in the next section as well, about not forcing yourself on others. And Jesus never forced himself. He moved on. Belief is a key theme throughout Mark, throughout all the Gospels, technically. But in Mark, belief is a key thing. Look at the very next verse in verse 6. He marveled, that is Jesus, because of their unbelief. Over and over again, remember all the miracles, all the resurrection, the resurrection that took place, the healing uh, of the um, woman who had bled for 12 years, all of those people who have been healed. What is the one common thing? Even with the demons, right? The demons professed the same thing, the belief in who Jesus was and what he was capable of. Now, theirs wasn't a profession of, hey, I really want to follow you and be baptized and all that, right? But they knew who he was, Jesus, the Son of God, right? Have mercy on us. So they're indicating they know what he's capable of. Don't cast us, right, out. They knew that he could condemn them. They, those demons, declared him to be equal with God. And belief is tied to the healings over and over and over again in the gospel. And then Jesus gets to his hometown, and because there is no belief, he can do barely anything there. Sometimes I believe the reason God doesn't work is because we're not quite sure he can work. I mean, we know theoretically that he can, but I think we all have moments probably where we we ask God for a great thing, but we don't truly in our heart believe he's going to do the great thing. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, I have a lot of favorite quotes, but one of my favorite quotes is uh, to try great things for God and to expect great things from God. Because if you don't expect great things from God. When you try great things for God, you won't see the results that only God can give. That's not part of the quote. That's just the reason I like it so much. And, and I think this is true. When we believe that God is capable and willing to do it, if it's within his will, then we see wonderful things happen, even in the gospels. And, and when he went home, I think that's the problem of going home. When you go home, it, people struggle with their belief for one reason or another. 
because as what was said earlier, the various things that they've seen as you grow up and that you're, wow, can this really be that guy? Or we know what kind of snot nosed little kid <laughs> this person was growing up. And so um, I think this is a good lesson and it kind of sets the stage for the ministry Jesus is about to give his disciples. It, it sets it that first of all, if Jesus is rejected in his own town, the people who were closest to him, if you will, if they rejected him, then the disciples and you and I can expect rejection, right? And so, but look what it says. Um, so in verse six, the latter part, he marveled after it says he marveled because of their unbelief. And then it says what Robert pointed out. I think it was Robert. Sorry if it was someone else that he went about among the villages teaching. He, he moved on. Whenever it became evident that they weren't, he spent a, a, whatever the amount of time was there, and then he decided to move on to more fertile ground. We talked about this with the parable of the sowers, that you sow everywhere, but there's going to be some rocky soil. There's going to be soil that doesn't have belief. And it's fine to scatter the seed there, but we don't spend most of our time there because even Jesus knew, and Jesus is going to tell his disciples here in a moment, that there is a time to move on. Now, that time is going to be different for each person, to be fair, right? And it doesn't mean you can't keep trying. But it, it, there are people who clearly have no interest whatsoever in hearing what we have to say. And, and sometimes it's like talking to a brick wall. And truth is, sometimes we can't get through to them, but somebody else can down the road. And so that, that's another interesting thing. But we see this happen. And then um, the people of Nazareth, these represent um, the blindness that we see throughout the leaders of the Jewish faith, as well as Israel as a whole. They refuse to believe Jesus. Uh, they refuse to buy into what he's doing and what he's capable of of doing and they refuse to connect who he actually is and we see this refusal as something they're going to experience as the 12 are sent out now we're going to go into the story of the 12 being sent out we're not going to spend a whole lot of time there because that's where our sermon's going to kind of branch from as well but it says in verse 7 he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two Okay, so I, I, I've talked about this when we see the sending of the 72, which I believe is Luke 10. I could be wrong on, on that. But um, I talk about this quite often whenever I talk about these types of texts. Notice he didn't send them out one by one. He sent them out two by two. It's great to do things in pairs. You have someone to help you. You have someone to support you. You have kind of a, a partner during it. And that's important. Uh, it's important to have a helper. You don't have to do evangelism one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you, you don't have to do anything alone. I think a lot of the issue, um, or, or at least in my short life on this earth, a lot of the issue I've come across with, especially churches in the North and even um, some within our congregation, has been Yes, some of it is, I just don't know what to say. But more often than not, it's people who know scripture. It's that they feel a lot more pressure going by themselves. When in truth, if you just go two by two, you know, it, it helps. Be, and, and what I love doing it in Bible studies, I love having someone else there with me, whether it's Katie or whether it's somebody else, because a lot of times I'm trying to explain something. I'm trying to answer a question. It's not making sense. And the person with me spits out the most simplistic answer ever. And it just opens the gates wide for their understanding because you're able to play off each other. But Jesus sent them two by two and he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. In verse 8, it says, he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. So why do you think he told them don't take any of this stuff? 
and maybe how does it relate to the what we've been reading? Maybe asking it another way will help. I'll give you kind of part of the answer. How does this relate to the motif of belief throughout the book? I think it kind of goes back to uh, verse number five, Josh. Okay. Talking about, you know, they got to have faith that, that it's going to happen. If they can do it. Yeah. You know? They got to really lay, in, lay the faith on him. And I think, I think that's dead on what the reason is. He wants them to trust him, to have belief in him, to have faith in him. Because, and we see this in kind of their training that they do when you read all the Gospels and you see the different trainings Jesus does with them. We see this theme come out over and over because he's preparing them little by little for stuff they're going to face when he is back in heaven. And it, he's, he's sending them out, and we're going to see he recalls them, and they give kind of, and he does the same thing with the 72, where he sends the 72 out, and after X amount of days, they come back, and they report to him what had happened, and they kind of debrief, if you will, the situation and how it was handled and such, and Jesus is helping them to rely on him and the Spirit and God, because they have to have belief, they have to have faith, because without that belief, without that faith, they will not be able to accomplish what God is tasking them to accomplish. And so they say in verse 10, or they said, he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. I think that's interesting. Again, I don't want to go too deep because we're going to get into this on Sunday, but I think this is interesting because he talked about, okay, go and find a house he, uh, this is the person of peace is what it calls it in Luke. Um, go and find this individual and you stay in this home until you leave that home. That kind of puts a lot more faith, right? It means you've got to, you've got to be a planner. You, you uh, I know whenever, um, whenever I was traveling in Europe, um, in, in college, one of the things was, uh, I, I, I was in kind of that person at, at the time of, you know, let's just show up and see what happens. Let's just get on a train, show up, and we'll figure out where to stay when we get there. Um, we had others who were, no, we've got to plan this out. We've got to have a hotel. We've got to have something booked before we get there. And um, I, I think, obviously, when you're traveling, it's probably a better idea to book ahead, especially because you never know when everything's going to be filled up. Um, but Jesus had them essentially go the first route, right? Of just show up and see who takes you in. He wanted them to rely on God's provision and God provides through people. And it doesn't mean he's providing through Christians by through this, by the way. Um, even whenever it talks about the people of peace, it doesn't mean it's a Christian because Christ hasn't died yet, right? It's someone who's willing to house them as they go and proclaim, and often it would become a disciple or it's believed, a disciple it's believed. But then look in verse 11. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, so it's two things. They will not bring you in to the home, right? Or they will not welcome you. And they won't hear you out. They won't listen to you. When you leave, Shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And so Jesus tells them to do this. He, he says, look, I'm sending you out. And whenever you come to a place, trust in God that someone's going to care for you. And if nobody receives you and nobody listens to you, then shake the dust off your feet and walk away. They were to rely on God for all of their needs. This was training for them because we see once Jesus returns to heaven, they, they get the spirit, but they have to rely pretty heavily on God because Jesus isn't in person walking with them anymore. It, Jesus passes his ministry on to them. They, rather than being spectators, they become players. 
in this. And so here they are told that you're to go into a home that is being hospitable to you, but then they're told, shake the dust off your feet. Uh, the Jews customarily would sh shake dust off of their clothes and sandals whenever they returned to the Jewish territory from Gentile territory. And so what they would do uh, is they would, before they crossed whatever line that was or wherever it was, they would literally kind of shake it all out because it was considered to be unclean and they were going back into the clean Jewish realm here. And, um, and it became a um, people of God versus a not people of God in the Jewish custom. So whenever they shook off their clothing with all that dust, they're preparing to re-enter into the people of God rather than those who were far from God in their mindset. So shaking dust off of their feet symbolized the filing effect of contact with these other people who had no interest in God. When the 12 did this, it, uh, one author writes, it implied that those who had refused their message were unbelieving, defiled, and subject to judgment by God. It was a visible sign of an individual, a household, or a community's acceptance or rejection of Jesus Christ. And so really what it was is they're not cursing them and condemning them to hell. It's an outward sign that is a custom in that day of saying you have rejected God. Just like the Gentiles rejected God in the eyes of the Jews, you have rejected God. And therefore, you are open to this judgment that takes place. You are open to the defilement, to the um, uncleanliness and so forth. And so, but it hits, once again, I keep coming back to Robert's comment. It, it hits that Jesus didn't say you make it your life work to stay in an area that is clearly rejecting him. He says you give it. <laughs> As some people say, you give it the college try. And then when it, whenever it becomes clear that they want nothing to do with Christ, you shake the dust off your feet and you move on. Because the harvest is plentiful, <laughs> Scripture says. It's just sometimes you find an area that doesn't want to produce. And so verse 12 so they went out and they proclaimed that people should repent. They needed to turn. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick. And they healed them. And so here we see, uh, and by the way, Mark alone mentions the 12 anointing people with oil here. Um, this is common for, uh, we talked about this on Sunday briefly. This was a common medicinal type of situation that they would do but it was also not just a um, actual act it, it was a metaphorical act as well which showed the uh, the love of god and the care of people and so forth but we see them sent out and they're now doing the things that jesus was doing because they're carrying on his mission and then mark likes these sandwiches we just saw one earlier when jairus comes to jesus and he says come heal my daughter and then dead center of that story what happens it gets interrupted by a woman who touches his cloak, right? And then it goes right, snaps right back to Jairus, and they move forward. This is the same deal. Jesus goes to his hometown. They reject him. He sends his disciples out. He tells them and instructs them what to do if they're rejected, but also tells them um, what to do in the event that they're received. So they're out doing what God has asked them to do. And then Mark interjects this story about King Herod and John the Baptist. In verse 14, King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. And then verse 15, but others said, he is Elijah, and others, he's a prophet. So we have three options, John the Baptist, Elijah, and the prophet. Now, John the Baptist hasn't died yet. But Mark is giving us kind of an idea early on that some think this is John the Baptist reincarnated, basically. Um, but when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, 
his brother Philip's wife because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, and then it, so it tells us the backstory. I love this. It, it's kind of like a soap opera, right? It tells us uh, all of a sudden why John lost his head. John had been said, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. I've always thought that was interesting. He knew John was a holy and righteous man. He protected John from his wife. Well, ish. And then we, and so I'll kind of share the story with you here and you can read this, but basically his daughter comes out and does a little birthday dance and everyone's so happy that Herod metaphorically says, uh, or suggestively says, um, you can have up to half of my kingdom. And it's not a literal half of the kingdom because Herod's not actually a king. He can't give away the kingdom. He's controlled by the Romans. Um, but, um, so he can't do that without Roman uh, approval, and uh, the the <laughs> and the Romans would not like that anyway. But what he's basically saying is, you have done such a wonderful job. Ask me, and I will give it to you as long as it's within my power. And so she mulls it over, goes to her mom, and what does mom say? Hey, you should ask for the head of John the Baptist. Why? Because this was her opportunity to shut the guy up. It was the opportunity to get move on from the sin that they're living in, to move on from the, uh, the situation at hand. And, and so this takes place. And then we see, um, and so Herod doesn't want to do it, but he gives in. But notice, Herod sees him as a righteous man. Herod sees him as a man of God, yet he foregoes that because he wrote, what, what's the saying? He wrote, he, and basically he wrote a check that he couldn't cash, right? He said something without thinking, and now he had a decision to make. Which wrong do I follow through? This teaches me, this story right here teaches me several things. One of the things it teaches me is we ought to be really cautious about what we say we're going to do and what options we give. We ought to be very careful about promises made because we can get ourselves between a rock and a hard place real quick when we're careless with our promises and our guarantees on things. But it also tells us that Sometimes when we let our guard down, making these grandiose promises, Satan will find a way to utilize that to try and tempt us to do something evil. I think personally, the right move by Herod would have been to say, well, you know what? I know what I said and forgive me for what I said but I cannot do what you're asking me to do. He would have had to kind of swallow his pride a little bit to do that, right? The problem is he said it in front of a bunch of people <laughs> and he didn't want to be a said to be a liar and rather he became a murderer, an executioner of a righteous and holy man. So the big one I get out of that is um, be careful what you give your word for. And secondly, even if you have misspoken or if you find yourself in the rock in a hard place, do the right thing. <laughs> do the godly thing. So we see this situation take place. That's the story between what happens, right? So right before this, Jesus sends out the twelve. Then this takes place, and then look what happens in verse 30. The, the 12 come back. The apostles uh, here, this is believed to not be the, um, the official apostle term, if you will, because they became official apostles whenever Jesus uh, rose from the grave. 
this, uh, they use the word apostle often as well, just to mean generally those who have been sent with the message, like a messenger. And so uh, the, those who were sent out is basically what most people believe this is saying, those who were sent out, the 12 that is, they returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and had taught. I love that. They, they told him everything. Wouldn't it be awesome if on Sundays we gathered together and we started telling each other what we had done and who we had taught and what we had shared about Christ with other people in the world, in our communities, in our jobs? Wouldn't that be awesome? Don't you think there'd be some energy in the church that you don't find in most churches? I wonder why, mo why we don't do more of that. Anyway. Just something to mola. Um, he said to them, so they come back and they tell him all these things. I imagine Jesus listening to them and like, oh, that is great. That is awesome. You, you know, I, I, I kind of picture it, you know, Peter really liked the praise. I kind of picture Jesus being almost like, who's a good boy? Who's a good 12? Who's a good 12, right? Good 12. Um, you guys did great. But look what he says. He said to them in verse 31, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place. And then he tells them why. Rest for a while. They had just gone out and done all this work. And he said, come and rest. Spiritual and physical rest was important to Jesus Christ. It's important to his disciples. And it's important to you and I where it should be. Um, spiritual and physical rest should be something each and every one of us participates in. Because when you're doing the work of God, you are exerting energy, right? When we're doing the work of God, I mean, it can get tiresome. I mean, uh, you, you know, when, when you're studying with someone and you're working hard and you're helping them talk and discuss the scripture that's hard enough but then what when you study with them and then they just kind of stop responding and stop showing up and they don't ever tell you why and man you just feel exhausted or maybe they've become a christian and you're discipling them and you're teaching them how to live the christian life and you're letting them see it in the scripture and you're answering your phone at all times during the day and night because they've got questions or they got situations it gets exhausting we need to have a time in which we go away to a desolate place. I think that's important, right? That place secluded by itself and rest a while. Be rejuvenated. And it says, for many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. They were tired. They were worn. And they went away in the boat to the desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran, and we're in verse 33 here, they're on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And we went ashore, a great crowd, sorry, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. I love that phrase, sheep without a shepherd. This world I don't think this world as is so much lost as it is a she as it is sheep without a shepherd. I think the problem goes back to what we've talked about. And by yes, I understand they're lost that they're not Christians. But what I'm getting at is I think it's not that the majority of the world hates God. I just don't think they know who to follow. They've got so many things in their ears telling them what the right way is, what the truth is, and they don't know the truth because there's hundreds of truths being presented to them and we see this people jump on every every single bandwagon following trends out there rather than knowing who the ultimate shepherd is and jesus has compassion on them and as you read through this um he he asks them how much food you know let's feed them let's not send them into the town let's <coughs> let's feed them let's give them something to eat they need nourishment these crowds do. I think Jesus had compassion on them because Jesus, was, Jesus feels for us. But notice also, not only did he have compassion on them, but he, I think he saw the opportunity. These people 
are desperate to learn the truth. Instead of sending them away, let's sit with them and teach them that truth. And I love what it says in verse 37. He said to them, that is his 12, you give them something to eat. Isn't that neat? You give them, you give all these people, these 5,000 people, something to eat. And I love, so Jesus, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? (laughs) It's a valid question. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. So they found they had five loaves and two fish. And so he has them group up. And then we, we know, hopefully we've read this. If not, read this later. We know what happens, right? The bread and the, the, sorry, the bread and the fish just multiply over and over and over and over again. Jesus says a prayer, begins dividing, and it doesn't run out. Yet another miracle showing the provision of God, showing what happens when you believe in God. And we we see all these, and it says in verse 43, they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate loaves were 5,000 men. That's important. 5,000, and what's important is the word men. Um, That's important because that doesn't count any children and women that were there. So what what you don't know is in this text, we find one of the most romantic ancient Greek words ever. And so tonight, look into the eyes of your loved one and say, Penta kiss hiloi. It's so romantic, isn't it? Jimbo, try that. Look look into Kathy's eyes and just Penta kiss hiloi. And it's great. Because she's going to say, Jimbo, what does that mean? And you're going to say 5,000. But isn't that a pretty word for 5,000? Man, that's so much better than English 5,000. Anyway, long story short. Um, Jesus does this. And then immediately, look what Jesus does. Immediately. He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismisses the crowd. And after taking leave of them, he went up on the mountain and he prayed. Jesus needed alone time with God as well. So notice he took his disciples to a desolate place to be alone with God and to rejuvenate. And Jesus practiced what he preached on this. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, so three to six in the morning, most people think, He came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. Have you ever thought about this? (laughs) He was going to let them struggle. (laughs) Oh, man. I I just, I love the picture in my mind of this, that they're like, oh, you know, they're, they're struggling and they're getting beat up by waves and all this other stuff. And um, Katie and I were on vacation with some friends several years back and we, we, uh, got a boat that we rented out for the uh, week that we were there. And, um, Katie and Heather, uh, decided that they wanted to go out to this, uh, one little Island and, um, uh, which was fine. And, um, that to get to the Island, you had to cross this area that was just churning where the, where the ocean comes in and there's a great big current there and um I, they had a name for it but i can't can't remember what it was but it was like sea of chaos or something like that and so you know hearing it you you should have been thinking and we went out and i just remember katie finally came out to me after we were beating our way through this trying to get to the other side we were almost halfway there and katie, katie finally like started grabbing and like pulling herself up to where i was on the boat um, driving it. And she asked, are you okay? And I don't remember what I said, but I probably said something along the lines of no. (laughs) And, um, she said, should we turn around to which, Oh, by the way, I should mention that, um, my buddy is terrified of, um, boats and deep water. 
And um, so I'm sure he will never get in a boat with us again after this. But um, we were trudging and we were, it was bad. I mean, we were getting kicked around so bad by waves. I told Katie, I said, I am afraid to turn the boat because the waves are churning so badly. I'm afraid of how big they are. It's going to roll us. And so we beat our way through. Um, and it was, uh, <laughs> And then, you know, what's fun is then, you know, you have to beat your way back through to get back to where you were going. Um, so, uh, but I, I imagine that picture in my head. And then I imagine while we're going through that, Jesus just kind of do, 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 walking on. And I mean, not even planning on stopping, just kind of, even if we saw him just waving, Hey guys, how's it going? But what happens is they see him and they, they yell out, Oh no, it's a ghost, Right. They cry out when they all saw him and they were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart. In other words, suck it up, buttercups. <laughs> it is I. Don't be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and look what happened. He steps in the boat. I imagine it's when his first toe just touched the boat and everything just went to a sea of glass. Everything ceased. And we're going to end on this. Look what it says. He got in the boat in verse 51, the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. They are shown over and over again the power of Jesus, but they struggle over and over again to understand just who Jesus is. One of the beautiful things about this chapter is we learn who Jesus is, the power that Jesus has, but we also learn this is the same Christ that sends us as he sent the 12. This is the same Christ who sent his spirit to empower us to carry on his mission. Now, we may not be calming waves and seas like he was, but that's the God that we proclaim. And this is the Christ that, that healed Jairus' daughter, that healed the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, that healed Legion. It's the same Christ. But people in this world are going to have different reactions to him. In fact, I'll just I'll spoil the last few verses for you here. He goes and he heals a lot of people. Guys, we have the answer to everything. The answer is Jesus. We have a world who are sheep without a shepherd. They're, they're lost. They're meandering around. They don't know who to follow. And our job isn't to tell them everything they've done wrong. Our job is to tell them the direction that will lead them to safety, that will lead them to purpose, that will lead them to hopefulness, that will lead them to righteousness. That's all we got to do. <laughs> and some will listen and some won't. But we'll be amazed at how many will listen if we will just proclaim who God is and let Scripture speak. The, I'll say this and then we'll say a prayer. Slightly off topic, but it's relevant to the sending out of the 12 when we're talking about that. We may not know every answer to every question, but the good news is it's, it's open book. <laughs> it's, uh, technically, it's open cell phone and open Google even, if you need it. We have been called to proclaim an amazing God. We are privileged to proclaim an amazing God and partner with him and his ministry. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the love that you show.